Ah, it's good to be back at console. You guys are filled with so much energy. I know you've all just had lunch, and I know we've just had the funding talk, but I'm here to uh, hopefully jazz you all up a bit and uh, talk about while we're all going to die in a hellscape and how we can avoid that. Um, so let's just oh, get that up. There we, there we go. Right. Ah, so yeah, normally I talk about game development specific stuff, really hyper focused stuff that'll make you a better developer. Um, but at, I spent a lot of time working on Big Sky projects, a lot of time working on social VR, and recently on Dreams, been moved to Media Molecule and been working on that, and that's all about dreaming big. And uh, there's a lot been going on in the world. So why do we need to talk about this? I'm going to start off with a very simple example before we get into the meat and bones. As you all know, I'm very passionate about virtual reality. And Facebook is the second, they have the second biggest VR consumer headset, and they're definitely one of the biggest players in the space. And as we all know from the news, there's a lot of trouble with Facebook. Um, and there's a particular set of announcements that this talk's been on the back burner for a while that put this talk right to the front of my mind um, recently with Oculus Connect. So the current development hardware that Facebook has has eye tracking. Eye tracking or gaze tracking is a core technology for VR for performance reasons, making... Um, foveated rendering, so it's, it's a necessary technology. However, it's also a primary technology we use in UX and user research and advertising. So uh, they know what you're looking at. Then they've been very, very cagey on biometric data. GDPR was a huge leap forward for uh, privacy. It was a huge counter blow against um, where we're heading. GDPR is one of the best laws that have been passed in recent years. I say this as a server programmer who's had a lot of trouble implementing for GDPR, and holy hell does it make my life difficult, but it's still amazing. The laws around biometric data are really loose. Um, I have friends who work, work, worked on gate recognition technology as far back as 2002, where we can actually recognize a person purely based on how long their arms and legs are and how they walk and pick them out in a crowd. And with virtual reality, with hand tracking, we know it's possible to recognize a person in a, a social VR environment purely by the motions they make. One of the first things when we were working on um, the Sony VR social project is we noticed we immediately saw the identity of the person even when the avatar was identical because we recognized how they moved their body. And there's been good studies on that. And when approached, Facebook has been very cagey about how they treat biometric data. And then finally, we had um, Facebook acquire a mind-reading company. Now, this isn't crazy sci-fi. This is, I'm sure you've all seen the toys, the Jedi toys, where you focus really hard and a ball goes up and down. It's quite old technology, um, but it's getting a lot more refined. It's proving drastically. And now if you think about it, the use case in VR, which is really cool, is you look at something, you think hard at it, and you push a button, right? But now, Facebook, has a vertical integration platform in the Quest that they've sold to you, that they own the entire thing. You can't crack it open. They're an ad-driven company. They know where you're looking. They're not telling you how much data they're tracking on you and what they're doing with that data. And they're working really hard at getting better at reading what you're thinking and when you're focused. This is a cyberpunk nightmare. So let's talk about what I've been doing. I've been doing dreams and dreaming big, and um, we've been working on this and trying to make this grand vision come true. It's on the PlayStation Store and Early Access at the moment, but this is a dangerous talk for me to give. I'm employed by a corporation. It's a corporation I trust and believe in, and I work in a very positive company where we can talk and um, discuss these issues. But um, you know, if you go through the press for a year, I'm sure you'll find a troublesome story about Sony. I definitely think they're one of the better companies for work to work for, um, but they are still a corporate interest. 
And, but we still make beautiful things. And we make beautiful things because we focus on people. And that's the last bit of corporate shilling I'm going to do on stage. But I really do think you should look at dreams because I'm very passionate about it. The team's very passionate about it. And I think as a studio, we are very people focused. But let's get back to the dystopian horror. <laughs> So cyberpunk, I love cyberpunk. I mean, you can just tell. I, my aesthetic is cyberpunk. I grew up with it. Um, there is so much in the genre I adore. And I have a friend who rants about the definitions of cyberpunk. He gives whole talks about it because people get it so wrong. They focus on the cyber part and not the punk part. This is a punk genre. Um, cyberpunk is all about primarily a warning to our society. If you actually read through the famous cyberpunk novels, as much as robot arms are really cool, all the characters who have augmentation, and I'm all for humans going beyond their limits, but all the characters who have augmentation, they're struggling to pay off that augmentation. They're dealing with medication issues around that augmentation. It's causing them huge strife. Like, augmentation in a cyberpunk is a metaphor for being blinded by tech. The other thing is cyberpunk is usually the near future because, well, when it was first rising up in the 80s, corporate dystopia hadn't really arrived. But now you can write a cyberpunk novel set in the past. You can write one set in the present. You have books like Circle coming out, which are cyberpunk, and they're set in the modern day and they're not a stretch of the imagination. And the final ingredient of cyberpunk is a concentration of power. We've always had a concentration of power in governments, but governments in their various forms are some level of accountable. And we work very hard to keep our governments accountable. We don't always succeed, but we work and we try. And I think on the, the large part, we do a much better job with our governments than we do with corporations. If you look at the amount of money and investment in corporations and the sway they have over global politics, I mean, just recently in the news with all the um, Blizzard fiasco that I'm sure you all saw and Nike with the NBA, that is corporate money transcending government regimes and that is huge pressure being put on superpowers. So in a, a small company, a small country like Norway, even though you guys have a bunch of cash and you have a bunch of freedom, you can imagine how much corporate influence is on your daily life beyond your governments. That's the last bit of this talk where I'm going to try to convince you we are in a cyberpunk dystopia. I could spend the entire talk on it, but we need to move on. We need to get positive here. So let's scope this talk because we do have limited time. I'm not going to talk about Brexit and all the hellscape that that's evoked, but I think it's one of... It's a really classic example and worth examining. I'm not going to tell you what you should believe and uh, where you should stand on the spectrum and what you should fight for. I obviously bring personal bias to the stage, and I'm going to disclose the two bits of personal bias up front that I think are most critical. The first is I obviously have a bias here where I believe we need to empower the individual. If you're someone who believes in dictatorship, if you're someone who believes in a hive state or um, various collective ideologies, then it's not going to mesh. You know, I say as a socialist, as a strong socialist, I believe that you know most of the uh, European ideals we have about working together still put the individual and the person at the heart of that. We care about people. Um, and the second um, bit of bias I'm going to disclose, along with the first problem we have, is lazy libertarians. So this is probably the root of our tech nightmare, is we are obsessed with shipping fast, with minimal viable product. And it turns out ethics are not minimal viable product. The ethical discussion is not part of our MVP, and it's led us down some dark roads. Even when we were building the internet, whenever someone talks about or speculates about how this will impact society and how we might need to put guardrails in 
um, historically, and you can go through the various email lists and standard committees discussions on this, this is all open and public, um, people dismiss any conversation about politics or any conversation about ethics because we're just trying to solve a technical problem. And this is, um, this is made worse by the libertarian bias in tech. Now, I will have, um, you know, get me rum and I'll talk about politics. Get me some tequila and we can dance around the difficult topics and get me some whiskeys and we can bury the bodies. And I'm happy to discuss libertarianism. I'm happy to go into the political theory and, and talk about the issues and the benefits potentially of it. Um, however, the form of lazy libertarianism that I think is so often espoused in tech is, well, this technology is apolitical. There's, this is just a tool that you're going to use. Um, it's all about how people deploy it. And as someone who builds things and engineers things, I know that a tool has a way it's designed to be used. I know it has ways or you know, there are desire paths that it generates in our society. So probably the core issue we have is when we're talking about technologies, one of the first things we de-scope is the squishy stuff, the stuff the engineers in the room don't want to talk about. Hilariously, um, when people implement social features and social network stuff for their games, one of the last things they think about is how are we going to handle moderation? How are we going to handle abuse? How are we going to handle block lists? I've seen multiple games go into um, early access or into early release or beta without these key features because, frankly, they weren't as important as, well, that laser on that robot just needs to be 10 times brighter. You know, it's, it's very easy to de-scope these tricky topics. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's it. But why video games? Well, because if you look at the cyberpunk genre, one of the key defining qualities is the heroes in cyberpunk. You have these massive corporations, this world that's gone to hell in a handbasket, and you have the plucky hero. The plucky hero is... Um, a keyboard cowboy, they are an artist, they're an engineer. Typically, the heroes in cyberpunk are people with an engineering or an artistic background. Because no matter how big Disney gets, no matter how big Google gets, at the core of it, there is an engineering team. And it's not a big engineering team. Even though Google hires tons and tons of engineers, the people who really know the core bits of their code it's a handful of people. And likewise with Disney, you know, no matter how big they grow that MCU, there's a handful of people and actors there that have power. And yes, they can be replaced. You know, you can always replace people, but it's much easier to replace the janitor than it is your core engineer who built this tech over the last 10 years and knows where all the bugs are and knows where all the assumptions are and has had all the off-the-book discussion meetings because, God, if we put this in an email, are we going to get sued? Um, you know, there's a lot of bodies buried and there's a lot of influence there. And it's all about um, focusing on that people element. So you are perfectly equipped to fight this war. You're perfectly equipped to make a difference. Finally, money is generally not our goal. I'm sorry, if you're in video games for money, guys, um, you can make money, but there is so much easier options. There is just, yeah. So thankfully, I think I can say money is, is not the primary goal for most people in the room. And culture is our power. We, we write and we engineer tools that are used by people daily. If you're an engineer at Twitter and you make a slight tweak to a thing, the amount of people that affects is huge. If you're a video game developer and you make a story about cyberpunk, if you make a, if you make a decision to add something in your game that makes people think about how they use social media or just how they share their pri private information or teach them things, that's powerful. That's something that extends your budget, extends the normal reach of an individual. So let's get to a game example again of how this all plays out, how we, we 
sleepwalk into the scenario. Looking for group tool. I think I've mentioned this before at console, but basically um, we've learned a lot of lessons from the original Destiny and World of Warcraft and World of Warcraft Classic. There's some great full-on talks about this, but basically the short version is Back in the day, back in my day, when we had to get a dungeon raid together, it was a, f it was a pain. You had to get everyone together, you had to shout at people, you had to negotiate, you had to find that one person who was actually a healer, who didn't mess everything up. And as part of that process, you talk to people. Much like when you say to people, let's go down to the pub. You're getting buy-in, you're agreeing to people, we're going for a pint, or we're going to go raid this dungeon, and you're setting the tone. Oh, we're going to take it easy, it's all chill. Oh no, right, are you equipped up? You da, 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 da. It's all part of that process. There's a huge amount of social knowledge we have as creatures on how to set the tone and how to recruit. And if someone's an asshole during that process, you know not to take them on this, right? Whereas the alternative is you all queue up in this tool, we are very convenient, and then you click a button and you get dropped into this activity, and then all of a sudden, you know, in the first two minutes, you realize you're grouped with a bunch of a-holes or just someone who doesn't know how to play their character or you've got to go in, you know, two hours and these guys are going to take three hours to run this thing. And no matter how many artificial things we put of XP penalties or whatever, it just doesn't work because people aren't engaged. We haven't had the social filtering. Um, we haven't got people to invest in the activity. That's really the key, getting them to invest. We've removed the human from this equation. And uh, this plays out in other ways, like Dunbar's layers, alternatively called Dunbar's numbers originally, he, the academic paper and the work he's done, he's improved it to layers, is about this 5, 15, 50, 150 thing. So when you played World of Warcraft Classic, right, in a server, for the server's all sharded, you immediately have your audience cut in half between Horde and Alliance. And then you have all the starting areas cutting your groups into different cohorts. And then not everyone starts playing at the same time, so then you, you segment that down to even further. The people who started in the same region as you play at roughly the same time and are roughly the same level. And so even if you don't intend to interact with these people, the number of names you're seeing in that area and the number of people you're seeing in that area is small enough that they become human to you. They're not just noise in the background because you start to see the same names. You're on the same quest even though you haven't grouped up and you see each other and you build that sense of community. You identify these as not robots in your fantasy world, you know, there to fulfill your needs, but as actual real individuals. And so this is a perfect example of how we can build something as engineers that sounds great and sounds like we're improving lives but we're actually destroying human connections. And that's not to say you can't build a looking for group tool that respects all of these things, but that takes consideration and time and engineering and thought. Legal is not ethical. I have been heavily advised not to encourage you to break the law. However, slavery was legal, tobacco companies' practices were legal, most of what companies were doing with your data prior to GDPR was legal. And today, there are many companies abusing loopholes in terms and conditions and contracts. Um, many of them are actually just outright breaking the law. There's several examples of that all the time. But if you are on a team and you are developing a feature, especially if you're in a bigger company, there's a tendency to go, let's send this to legal. Legal is never a guiding light. If you have principles as a team, because what, what happens when you send that off to legal, they will copy paste the best template they have around. And if they have to write any documentation, they will write it in the most authoritarian way, the broadest scope with no emotionally loaded language that gives them the most rights as a corporation doesn't necessarily respect your users. And if you're signing a contract with someone, doesn't necessarily respect you. So, for instance, if you as a developer want people to own their IP, if you as a developer care about how your relationship with your players and with you know, their content, you know, if you're making them own, they're investing all this time, and you actually 
give a shit. You have to take that to legal and you have to say, we want to draft it so it's like this. And they, they might immediately respond with you like, or they might just say no. And then you've got to actually go back and fight and you've actually got to go back and work it out. And sometimes you'll work with lovely people in legal, like not all lawyers are bad. So there's some wonderful lawyers. It's just there's systematic design in the legal profession that works against you here. Um, there's a lot of lawyers who are really good at writing up ethical stuff and are really good at having these difficult conversations. And especially if you're um, someone who cares about this stuff or has passion in certain areas, finding good legal representation or finding good people who can help you navigate this is just a massive, massive asset. And, you know, some of the worst things that have happened in tech, we have discovered because people broke the law. You might be fortunate to work in a company that has very strong whistleblower policies. Um, I encourage you, if you're hired by any company of any decent size, to look into what your whistleblower policies are and to see if anyone successfully used them in the past because most companies of a decent size will have those. But I'll also give you a reality check and say, if you ever intend to whistleblow, have a backup plan because... Greed is a very powerful force in our world. And if you read up on the history of whistleblowing, you will see that there has been a lot of people who have been suppressed and um, in some cases even killed. So it's, this is big boy game. This is, this is shit tons of money. If you are going against large corporates, it's a thing. It's a heavy slide. I don't know how to make it any lighter. But ye gods, guys, don't sue me. Um, so let's talk about this Uber for X model. It's if you ever if you read anything in tech, anything in games, you will hear buzzwords all the time. One of the buzzwords in VC land that's run around for the last while is Uber for X. Um, the best cyberpunk analogy for this is the Johnny Cab, the Johnny Cab, which appears like so. The best description I've heard for Uber is if rich people want to hire servants on demand and not think about their humanity. That's really what Uber is. And I say this as someone who uses it occasionally, you know, and like sometimes a country doesn't have an alternative and, you know, maybe I don't speak the language or maybe I'm just freaking lost, but it's, you know, it's a problematic issue. And, you know, there's positive ways to fight this. So, for instance, at Media Molecule, most com companies will hire... Um, a subcontractor to do their janitorial work, or they'll hire subcontractors for security or for catering, because then they can say, we do all of these wonderful employee benefits and we do all these great stuff, but then they treat those low-level workers like absolute shit because they don't think about them as people, because if they have any issue with them, they don't even have to fire them. They just get the subcontracting company to rotate them out. And it's just disgusting, because they're people. Whereas at Media Molecule, we have these two lovely chefs, Kath and Owen, who are just regular part of the staff. They're as much a member of the team as I am. They make our lovely lunches, you know, go out to the kitchen, hang out with them. They occasionally make cake. It's great. They come to all our parties. They're as, you know, they're, they're awesome. If either of them left the, left the company, it would be a big blow, just like if anyone else in the company left the big blow. Um, so you can do it. There are ways of doing this. The other thing I would say is if you actually go read the original economics paper on um, disruption, in, uh, um, the origin of disruption culture by Clayton Christensen, um, Uber does not fit that model. Most Silicon Valley tech disruption does not actually fit the economic model of disruption that was proposed. And he actually, um, the original piece I believe was, I think, 95 he wrote it. It might have been later, maybe 2005. But he, as recently as the last few years, wrote a takedown piece on Silicon Valley using his economic theory incorrectly because economic disruption, as he proposed it, was all about providing... Um, and the classic case that he used in his original paper was mainframes and PCs. Economic disruption is about 
targeting the low end of the market, about broadening that out. Whereas a lot of this um, Uber for X disruption is about targeting the high end, is about, uh, about replacing existing um, competitors with um, more bourgeois services. Um, you know, and in terms of like how engineering practices bleed into the culture of these companies, there's two, two stories I want to quickly talk about. A story that's quite old about God mode. Um, back in the day, Uber threw a party, uh, had a whole bunch of investors and people there. Thankfully, one of the plus ones was a journalist. And some engineer thought, as you do, because it sounds cool, right? We know where all these drives going on in San Francisco are. We can put up on the screens at this party these live maps showing all the Ubers in San Francisco and showing the people getting on and off and showing their names. How did you not think this was an awful idea? Well, and thankfully, there was a journalist there, and thankfully, the story broke, and the huge breach of privacy and just the huge everything that it was came to light, and Uber was like, oh, I'm sorry. Slap on the wrist. Um, but, you know, and then another wonderful thing they do is dynamic pricing, right? Next time you're getting an Uber with, say, three or four friends, all of you order an Uber to the same place you will notice some of you get a different price. That's because Uber has a machine learning model running in the background, trying to figure out how much you will pay for this ride. And if they think, hey, you're, whenever you open Uber, you always accept the price we give you, or we know you're going to do this, your price may be a little higher. But then on the flip side, they do this with drivers as well. And then that bit in the middle that shrinks and grows, um, yeah, that just goes to Uber. There's no, there's no exposure to the driver, how much you're paying. There's no exposure to you, how much the driver's getting paid. Um, and that, again, is not a surprise. Some engineer had to do a lot of hard work to implement that. Right. So you're saying, oh, Claire, this is not engineering. Where's your normal talks about stuff? Where's all the details? Um, here's the thing. It's important for you to think about system design because you won't always have someone above you thinking about system design. And when you are working with a system designer, you need to be able to talk to them about these problems. You need to be able to raise these problems because, frankly, if you're the person writing the code, the buck stops with you. I guarantee you, if you go into uh, court cases where people have written code, you'd be amazed at how often the buck has stopped with the particular engineer's decision to write the code a certain way, especially if it was a verbal instruction and never put down in a JIRA ticket or an email. And, oh, God, I've had some fun times with that where there have been verbal discussions because this is too tricky to talk about on email. Um, yeah, so it's good to have that. It's good to do that. It's good to potentially, if you've got a bad spec, to fight it. And also, especially, and we're going to talk about this a bit, in machine learning and maths cases, the designers might not know everything there is to know about your implementation. Right? It's important as you for an engineer, especially for these abstract systems. You know, you can make the connection that, gee whiz, this fingerprint data we are not like salting and hashing it, or we haven't actually isolated it in a way that, oh, if this database ever got leaked, oh, wow, oh, wow. And you would be amazed at how many fingerprint readers you can still buy on the market today that store your fingerprint on board on a chip that I can go and get, and I get all your fingerprint data out, and it's wonderful. And um, yeah, there you go. Go to more security talks. They're fascinating. Um, and finally, um, in the spirit of my legal slide, malicious compliance is your friend. And I'll leave it at that. Um, right, top level issues. Um, a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, so we're not going to dive into all of these, but uh, efficiency really matters. I've said before, your terrible, shitty code is causing climate change. You're boiling the oceans alive if you run a whole bunch of extra servers because you couldn't be asked to optimize your code. That's a real effect you're having on our world today as an engineer that I'm sure no one's chasing you up about. Um, and, you know... It's easy for companies to, often companies will want good PR where they'll be like, we need, we need something to make the green people a bit happier. And, you know, they might go plant a few more trees. Or you might, as an engineer, use this as an opportunity 
to improve the product. And I mean, I was very chuffed with Sony recently when we announced that the PS5 is going to have half a watt of power usage in suspend mode. That's a huge deal, right? Back in the days of like the 360 and the PS3, there was like 60 watt on idle consumption. And when you multiply that by how many consoles are out there just plugged in under TVs, that's a lot of power usage. And you'd be amazed at how many times game developers burn up batteries or mobile or desktop developers on your menu, you're running the full menu at 60 frames a second and you're nailing that GPU. Hell, you've unlocked it so it's like full of running above 140 frames a second. But that's a sexy menu. And you're just like, really? Is that necessary? Um, you know, it's small differences, it's small differences. I'm not going to, in this talk, talk about tracking and analytics. It's a topic we've spoken about, and I feel while it's something we still have to attack, and especially with biometric issues, it's somewhat an issue that as regulatory bodies and such have jumped on. I feel like it's something that we have a lot of cultural awareness on, and I feel like it's a place, it's a good topic we're in. It's something we've got to keep our eyes on, and as an engineer, you are the last person who actually understands what what calls are being made out and what data has been saved out. And for God's sakes, I know it's so useful during your development build to have the game record or do intense um, analytics. But ask yourself, do you need to ship that in the production version? Think about your debug code that you know just grabs the entire profile and saves it locally to the disk because you, know, you needed that JSON file because QA was there and then you ship the game and you realize you're breaking GDPR because you couldn't be asked to turn off a development feature. It happens. And think about tech dependence, right? Really think about when you are cutting people's arms off and making them really depend on a thing. Uh, funny story, I've been mostly off Facebook for like three years or so. Like I haven't had the app on my phone for like at least three years. But recently, I still was using it because friends, and it's really hard to unplug that shit. And um, started this year, I made the decision to just fully unplug from it, and I actually like changed my password and wrote it down and like put it away, so I have to actually go and get the password. You know, it's not in my password manager or anything. I still today, maybe once every two days or so, find myself compulsively start typing facebook.com into the browser, just because it's in my brain. I have developed that dependency. And I, you know, you're getting rid of it and all that jazz, but think about when you are making people dependent on your tech and think about how you can open that up, offer alternatives, get them to step away from the product. I know, shareholders hate to hear it, but there. And finally, the thing I really want to get my teeth into is recommenders, because I spent a lot of time working with recommenders and uh, dealing with recommenders. I built the original um, Dreams recommendation code and spent a lot of time working on um, machine learning stuff. Um, Right, personal tech, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to run through this. Open source your work. You'd be amazed at how many companies let you open source your work. One of my favorite things, another talk I'll give sometime, is about engines. Um, but Sony WWS actually has a GitHub. Um, not everything we do is posted up there, but you know we have a process to get stuff out there, and Microsoft has a similar process, and Google has a similar process. If you're ever working with a corporate, they probably want that good bit of PR, and you know they rip off enough open, soft, open source software. So try get permission to release stuff open source. Um, I highly recommend anyone interested in engines or tools tech look at the ATF stuff from Naughty Dog that they actually posted in that GitHub. It's very cool. I am GUI is everywhere. I am GUI started as a debug GUI tool, um, immediate GUI in Terraway, in Media Molecule, where I work. And they... Um, Omar was like, hey, can I continue this in my free time? And they were very good about saying, yeah, no, go off, go for it. And now I, everyone uses I'm GUI. I'm GUI is great. If you haven't seen I'm GUI, like even NASA uses I'm GUI, you would be amazed at how broad that's gone. And it was just from a little game. And sometimes you can't open source stuff, but you can work with others and help out smaller people. So like um, the Concrete Genie guys are based in Guildford. And um, they were at a party and they were complaining about they couldn't get some tech to work with um, drawing stroke stuff. And Mark, one of our graphics programmers who did the stroke, paint stroke code in Dreams, was like, hey, you know, I've got this code that I wrote for Dreams. Do you guys want it? 
and you know talked to people and got permission and Concrete Genie took our um, paint stroke code and built on it and improved stuff for their uses. So yeah, you th there is. I mean, I feel like that last point. It's so great in Norway with your collectives and stuff. You're really good at working with each other. Hacker culture. Get involved in hacker culture. It's the best. Like watch a few security talks. Be aware on how to break your stuff open. Be aware for when you know your corporate overlord wants to send the robot to kill you. It's actually a great book, um, Surviving the Robot Apocalypse, that I highly recommend because it actually provides pretty practical information about disabling sensors and stuff. It's really humorous. But having a bit of knowledge about culture and hacker culture specifically is really empowering in so many ways. And a um, really funny thing about life hack culture, actually, um, you know, it used to just be called um, women's magazines because all the life hack stuff used to just be how to get stuff done around the house faster. Um, so hacker culture, just engage with that. It's really, really useful. Oh, God, time. Um, YouTube censorship. Oh, my God. Hot topic. Uh, so many videos on this, but this is Machine Learning 101, How to Build a Monster, is YouTube. So you're in a world where you've got so much video to deal with, and all of the just worst things are getting uploaded. And, oh, my God, is this expensive. So someone comes up with a bright idea. Let's build a machine learning model to find really bad stuff really fast. New stuff that we haven't already seen, because old stuff we can filter out quickly. Right, OK, we've built this model. Uh, we're not 100% sure about it, so we'll only get this model to take stuff down when it's 90% certain. Right or 95% certain, right? Because it's a fuzzy measure. Oh, okay, that kind of works. Now let's say that this this code you've written is good enough that it catches 99% of bad videos. Right? In a million videos, that's still 10,000 videos you didn't catch. And that then means that some journalist can come along and go, "Here's a video that slipped through. Oh, it's got a prominent ad next to it. Let me take some." Um, screenshots and stuff, because you know it's not like new media is totally my competition in this uh, thing. It's not like I have a business interest in making these people look bad. Okay, smear campaign time. Vroom. And now all the brands panic because, oh shit, we don't want our ad against the beheading video. That would be really bad, um, even though it wasn't against the... Anyway, um, so then you go, okay, well, we've got this machine learning model. First thing we can do is we can make it a little bit more sensitive when it's 80% confident. And then what we can do is we can say, hey, you know, um, advertisers, come and let's show you a bunch of videos. What videos are you happy advertising against? What videos are you not happy advertising against? Let's take all that implicit bias and just sort of feed it into a machine. And because we're feeding all that into a machine, and at no point are we writing this down in policy, we're not legally you know, responsible, because it's just preference, ad safe, ad safe. And um, we've got these human reviewers, because we still need these human reviewers, and um, we're going to give them a policy for their reviewing, but uh, shit, uh, we can't write that down, because if we write that down, we're going to get sued. Right, OK, let's keep it loose. Right, no, 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 that's about right. Oh, okay, so the video goes to review. Ah, oh, wow, these guys are expensive. Can we hire someone in a third world country through a subcontractor? Yep, that sounds like a great way to save money. Right, so the third world person totally has the same cultural biases as the majority of our audience, right? You know, it's not like um, being gay, this, still illegal in their country. It's not like, uh, you know, domestic violence is rampant in the area and uh, all kinds of other issues. Oh, okay, so we're going to encode all of their biases into this machine learning algorithm that we've done. Oh, crap, our machine learning algorithm is really bad, guys. It likes Nazis. Well, um, and it's, it's banning all the gays. Shit. Um, we need to go on to a press interview. Does YouTube ban videos with these words? And oh, there's no word list anywhere that bans these things. <clears throat> I, I'm sorry, but uh, the machine learning engineer in the corner is cringing because he knows that the machine learning algorithm has really just learned to detect different features. Some of those features are going to be words. And um, oh, shit. Well, a legal issue, not technically lying, but OK, whatever. Oh, hacker culture. 
Oh, right, turns out some independent hackers come along and go, I know how machine learning works. Let's run an experiment. And there's this great video out there, you can find it, where a bunch of hackers ran an experiment where they just took a bunch of the same video and they titled it slightly different things. And gee whiz, we managed to reverse engineer a list of words that this thing will flag as offensive. Bear in mind, this list is not perfect because of how machine learning works. And it might have changed since they did their videos. But lo and behold, did a whole bunch of interesting words flag up. Obviously, you've got the classic ones like a lot of the, um, so like gay didn't get flagged, but lesbian got flagged, um, and all these other cases that go through. Um, but then you've got these, there's another really interesting concept that uh, Daniel Boyd's written about called uh, data voids, that people take, uh, the um, right-wing media is really good at uh, taking advantage of these. In a machine learning and algorithmic place, um, you're competing for first page on Google. So what you do is in your reporting and in your thing, you take advantage of a data void. So instead of reporting on um, Norway as Norway, you start reporting on Norway as, you know, um, white water land or something, right? You come up with some phrase, some terminology for an event. You find a code word that's technically the same as everyone else is using, but technically it's a different word. So now all the machine learning algorithms are picking it up in a different thing. So now when everyone else searches for the very common use of the, of the word that you would expect, they get all the things you'd expect. But when people exposed to your media start searching this, they start to find all the same sort of stories about the same conspiracy theories and they go down a deep rabbit hole and they never see anything that conflicts with their viewpoint. And oh my God, aren't data voids fun? <laughs> They're hell to deal with in recommender land, but hey, these are the realities. Open data is the biggest tool we have. Um, governments are really good about opening their data. There's a lot of, um, I was really happy to see the panel earlier, um, the award earlier today about um, data partnerships. If you can ever pressure anyone you're working with to open up their data, to open up their data sets, the amount of amazing journalism, the amount of empowering tools that have been developed for societies have been really great. And games have a shit ton of really cool data. Um, the short version is go look up the WoW pandemic issue when they had a virus bug. There's some really good research that's been done based on that data. Make your endpoints visible and secure. Right? Let people fuck with your shit. Let people mod your games. Let people play with the things. P plan for people to play with the things. Um, because, let's face it, if a community has built up all of this awesome value, if you're running an MMO or you're running um, a game that has a big you know, culture that has built up to the value of the game, part of that belongs to them. And you've got to think about that stuff. Okay, ethical recommenders. Um, this has been my passion for the last two years. Um, I think recommenders are here to stay, and I think we can build ethical recommenders. The first step is good open data, right? Because if we get everyone to open up their data, then we can build recommenders. So the first thing to acknowledge is every math operation has bias. If you have a class of 100 people and they have different marks and you say, oh, we're going to get the average, so we're going to just take all of their um, stuff and we're gonna add it up and we're going to divide, that's how well that class is doing. In that mathematical operation, you've made a decision to take the center of mass and if for instance, five students are performing really well or five students are performing really badly and that's affected things. You're not seeing that in your measurement. But then if you say, well, let's take this list of 100 students and crop it and uh, cut it in the middle and just look at the score in the middle and that's how we're going to judge the class. Well, again, that's a, sl that's a slightly different measurement, not a better or worse measurement. You're more likely to get how the general feel of the class is and remove outliers, but... Okay, but then you can go, oh, what if we actually care about the deviation, like how far the top to the bottom mark is? Well, that actually might show, you know, like where your top leaders are and where your fallers are and where classes have huge disparity. You might be able to spot a problem. And all those are three different measurements. Those are three different things. They're all math operations, but they all introduce bias into how you're going to measure that. So it's important as an engineer that you think about these things. 
Um, avoid state-of-the-art. Um, if you go buy books on writing recommenders or you go read papers about recommenders, first of all, most people writing recommenders are ad-based companies. In their core math, they have baked in assumptions about view time or watch time or engagement being the best thing ever because it means we shove more ads in people's faces. They have baked in all these kind of assumptions. Um, the other people building recommenders in a large case are shopping websites. And there, they're optimizing the margin in basket. There's different ways, they, different terminology they use. But they care if you buy 10 objects that they're getting the maximum amount of money from that, ob that basket. And while you as an individual may care about fair trade coffee beans, they're going to show you a shit ton of value brand coffee beans and blends that they think they can sell to you because there's a higher margin. Now, if their recommender really thinks you'll never buy those, they'll then you know, show you the posh stuff. But um, you know, by even them showing you five blends and stuff that isn't fair trade and then the one, that actually moves your bias window even. So you might actually be more inclined in the future to buy their cheap Tesco brand coffee or whatever. Um, so they're affecting your behavior in a big way. Um, but yeah, so those, that's the state of the art, right? So always be careful with the state of the art. Make sure you understand the math, right? A lot of this is just algebra, a lot of this is just, um, solid engineering, you know, make, make under, understand the monster you're building. Keep it under your control. Ask questions about what you're measuring. If you're working with designers or if you're a designer working with an engineer, pose hypotheticals. Talk about what happens if, you know, in our, in our game someone builds this thing or someone does this thing or you know, build strawman arguments, get, build an understanding of how consumer behavior, so like if you start boosting stuff because it's got a lot of conversation on it, because historically, you know, stuff with conversation on it is high value, and then you're like, well, but what if two people get into a flame war, or what if a whole bunch of people just start commenting K, 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 you know, like, how does that affect the recommender? Build an understanding for it. You might not be able to solve all the problems, but you'll have an understanding of what the problems are. And I think the best way we can build an eth uh, ethical recommender is if we're building open source or purchasable recommenders. Can you imagine a world where you're... Uh, and I think the place for this to come is video games, because we're starting to build recommenders for video games, and this is where the small bits of knowledge are developing outside of corporate land. But imagine a world where I go onto Steam or I go onto Tesco and the things that are being recommended to me by my personal recommender, which I purchased or is open source, are recommending things to me that are made by local developers or made by local farmers or I'm being recommended stuff that is... Um, of a certain flavor or low in fat or high in sugar or I'm, rec I'm recommended stuff that doesn't have any microtransactions in or I'm recommended stuff that um, hired most uh, a, a highly diverse development team. You know, this recommender can sort through this huge amount of data and enforce the good values I care about. So it is possible to build this stuff. You know, we can get to a cool future where we have robot arms and battery life that lasts longer than I gabber. There we go. Um, we can get to that cool future. We can build these cool things in a way that doesn't become a horrible dependency on people, that doesn't drive people into poverty. We can build for people, not for corporations. And I feel as artists, as people who make things for the betterment of mankind, we make things to make people happy. We want to bring joy to people's lives. And yet, we're also a handful of people who understand culture and understand engineering. We're potentially the people who can move the needle. And we're also the people that large corporations will come to with very big paychecks and ask to do horrible things. So just think about what kind of future you want to have. With that, questions?
Yeah, yeah, okay, there's a mic, yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, I, th I thought we'd, we'd run through the process enough. Yes, there is a mic at front, lovely people. Thank you, I'm just a bit slow. Um, I was just thinking, is there uh, an implied uh, call for unionization in what you're saying? Because all of these things, standing up against your employer and government and everybody who's, who's trying to take advantage of our fantastic craft, it's all well and good, but it's terribly dangerous, as you also uh, mentioned. And it's really hard when you're as a game designer. I've myself been asked to uh, create uh, designs that will suck people in, mm -hmm. uh, maximize engagement and things. I'm thinking, I'm not sure I want to do that. I think that's a, that's a bad idea. And, and then, uh, but how do I stand up to that without a... Hippocratic oath of game designers, well, or, so, or, or, or or a union who stands behind me and say, you know, it's fine. Stein, it's it's okay to do that. You can't make him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, very good point. Unions are the backbone of collective bargaining and they really are how we empower people. One of the reasons there's not a union slide in here, that's a very loaded political thing, but I personally strongly believe in unions. Um, I know I've told these stories very quickly in console in the past, but I'll very quickly give you a rundown on them. Um, in my first game studio, I... Um, I got threatened to get fired, but what was worse is my mother, who worked as the accountant at the studio, also got threatened to get fired because they were trying to co combine our contracts. And I went around the entire studio with clauses that people were problematic and say, please tick against the clauses that you have an issue with and sign. And you know, I got strong-armed and it was really horrid and that was my first studio and I wasn't strong enough. But then later when a, a company hired me and flew me out and, um, you know, uh, turned around and said, instead of working on this fitness game that's going to improve people's lives, we want you to make a Clash of Clans, uh, Clash of Clans clone. And I was like, no. And that did result in me tearing up a contract, putting myself six grand in debt, moving back, paying for movers, losing all that stuff. And so, yes, unions are great, but sometimes you might be in a tricky position. Um, and it's where you draw the line. But yes. Hi, uh, great talk as always. Um, you were talking early on about the uh, World of Warcraft thing, where you went from mm -hmm. the old days where you got together a group and you had to make friends and social relations, and now it's just the looking for group thing. But like in the olden days, there was also like guilds that were horribly toxic, and yes. you know leaders that strung on people into. Whatever. So what I'm wondering is, like, how do you build mechanics into the game, the social mechanics that doesn't only like promote social relationships, but also promote good social relationships? I mean, it's the whole talks and whole books written on, but the short version is you need to have those conversations in the studio. You need to not only read game design papers, but speak to anthropologists. If you're a corporation that's big enough to run an M MMO, you're big enough to bring an anthropologist in for a day and have a conversation with some people who study human behavior. Shocker. Um, but yeah, so have the humility to realize you might not understand everything about it and think it through is really the only solution. Um, there's not going to be a, here's how to solve all of human problems. Um, yeah, no, that's the best advice I can give. Hi. Um, in dreams, are there any like systems in place to decide what people can or cannot make? Is it, so, is it censored um, in any way? There is, a, there is a EULA and there is a Terms of Service. Uh, at the moment, we're a 12 rated game. So our moderation team has to work to the 12 rating. Um, so th yeah, those are, the, those are the systems in place. Um, generally speaking, um, you know, it, it, it <laughs> I can't talk about like our explicit like guidelines and stuff or like our conversations internally, because hell, not, we don't even all agree. The honest truth is, if something truly problematic comes up, it's reviewed in the studio and it's talked about. Like as in if something doesn't f clearly fall into the policy bucket as has been defined, um, there is discussion. And that has happened more than once. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think the big thing, the big responsibility with dreams 
um, and this is said publicly, is we believe it is a 10 year plus project. We believe it is a platform. It's a thing, it's a huge thing. Um, and there's responsibility that comes with that. Thanks. Uh, so you were talking about whistleblower uh, culture. Uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering, do you have any examples of typical whistleblower situations that could arise with employees? And what are some typical whistleblower policies that companies could have? Hit me up on Twitter. I can. There are some notes in my research that I can get um, out. Um, just seeing here if I've got... I think we're going to end with this question. Sorry, because <laughs> you hadn't said over yet. Um, yeah, but like we've got stuff with uh, Mazidia and Theranos and um, other companies that have gone into trouble. Hit me up on Twitter. I've got some notes um, from the prep talk. But um, yeah, uh, outside of just modern tech companies, there's, if you go to the origin of the whistleblower laws, there's some pretty horrendous cases that have happened there. Um, I know Sony has a policy. It's really good. I, I know that uh, Microsoft and... Um, Google and Facebook all have whistleblower policies. Um, and generally speaking, the stuff you'll be dealing with as an engineer, unless it's really politically sensitive, will succeed going through that whistleblower policy, you know, because usually it'll just, people aren't inherently evil, right? Like, it'll just be some middle manager or it'll just be some person who's trying to push, you know, a particular product or a feature or not thinking it through, rushing over the ethical concerns potentially. And that's where whistleblower policies work out really well. Um, when you find out your CEO has secretly been meeting with a bunch of political lobbyists and doing horrendous things, the whistleblower policy might be a bit harder. So yeah, it's just how you approach that. And there's great apps out there, by the way. Even if you're not currently engaged in sensitive work, I highly encourage you to look at the open source apps, particularly for private messaging. And most journalists and most people who work with this stuff will post their signal or their, um, their various identities to be contacted. Um, so yeah, there, we're getting better at this um, as a culture, handling this stuff. So, hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I think we've got to wrap that there. So, a big round of applause to Claire.